Well, shall we uh, get started? Yeah, it's my, the flow. My... Okay. I think you were going to handle the uh, update slides, right, Jeff? Yep. I will. Okay. Uh, Take it away. Welcome to our second uh, RTGWG meeting, ITF 110, still virtual, still going. Next slide, please. Please read not well if you are not familiar with the defined rules of your contribution to ITF. And there are all the BCPs that explain how things work. Please, next slide. Uh, IPR disclosure specific to RTWG. We always pull IPR twice during draft adoption as far as working group last call. Please note that we won't progress unless we receive APRs from all relevant authors and contributors to the draft. Next slide, please. Uh, we are announcing AD change. Actually, we are not announcing, we are just telling you that it's going to happen. I would like to thank Martin for all the great work he has done while being our AD, and we welcome Alvaro back. Uh, let's review the agenda first. Next slide, please. So yesterday meetings we shared with RTG area, and today we are going to have our regular RTGW agenda with Greg starting and then uh, Mike and Fan and Cheng and Chifeng talking about their relative drafts. Next slide, please. document that in our past working group last call the policy model has been submitted to ASG for quite some time we are waiting on ASG uh, BGP peak draft has been in last call for two and a half months receipt number of comments uh, we've seen author replying that they're going to address them we are still waiting for authors to start addressing the comments next slide please we didn't publish any RFCs since last ITF. Uh, the drafts that expected to go into working group last call are QS model, rib extended. We are looking for shepherds for both drafts. Uh, TILFA draft is ready to go as well, and Stuart Bryant agreed to shepherd the document. Thank you, Stuart. Next slide, please. Uh, we recently adopted uh, Service X egress protection draft. And last slide, please. Uh, ongoing working group documents are ATN, BGP, and oh, that's it. Thank you. And if no questions, we are ready with the first presentation. Greg. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, would you help me projecting? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm planning to project your slides if I can get it to switch over. Uh, I'm going to go to full screen in a moment. So uh, let's see. Go to AM. Okay, I think we're good. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, integrated OEM. Um, well, we do have uh, different components of OEM. Usually OEM understood as taking uh, two parts, uh, two letters in uh, FCAP's acronym. So it's a uh, uh, fault management and performance monitoring. Fault management is concerned uh, with their uh, detection um, of network failure, uh, localization and characterization, and performance monitoring. Uh, it's obviously a measurement of different performance metrics. Uh, usually it's a packet delay, packet loss, but based on that, there are different other metrics can be uh, calculated. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, so far, uh, we worked on different protocols um, for fault management and performance monitoring. And uh, we have learned quite a lot. Um, one of the most uh, broadly used and very successful is uh, bidirectional forwarding detection. And uh, there are a lot of uh, hardware-based um, support for this, and it scales well. But what we learned is that security is important, but doing uh, security or authentication at 3.3 milliseconds of, uh, for each packet is very expensive. Uh, extensibility is uh, very important and useful. And we want to minimize the number of OEM protocols that are required to operate networks. So that's one of their main motivations for uh, looking at integrating fault management and performance monitoring under one protocol umbrella. Um, active performance measurement OEM and active, this is uh, in definition from RFC 7799 that uh, defines the active as using specifically constructed test packets. Um, at the same time, so at ITF and uh, elsewhere, we there are a lot of uh, consideration and uh, work being done uh, for on-path um, OEM or telemetry information collection that uh, uses uh, data packets uh, marked specifically or arranged uh, specifically uh, to generate uh, information about uh, performance and um, experience by the packets. So uh, what are looking for uh, performance monitoring? Usually it's a one way, but uh, two way is important. And uh, it needs to be a flexible uh, enough uh, to do packet loss and delay uh, measurement separately or in combination. The security is critical. And again, uh, as for their uh, fault management extensibility. Combining this uh, two uh, fault management performance measurement is that uh, integrated OEM we're proposing to build a lightweight path continuity check, have it powerful and flexible uh, with the performance monitoring uh, mechanisms, provide security option, and make it extensible. Next slide, please. So what we are proposing? This reflects, um, displays their uh, format of the base uh, control message, uh, list their uh, fields. Some of them are very familiar. And the TLV. So the basic TLV extension includes uh, type field, reserved field, length, and then um, variable length uh, value field. Next slide, please. Um, one of the uh, very important uh, properties uh, for the uh, uh, integrated OEM is capability negotiation. So what we want to have is we want to have that both all the no, well, both nodes can participate in negotiating their capability and adjust their intervals so that system would not be overpowered by their um, active uh, test. Currently, uh, what we propose uh, is 
are uh, WAS measurement, delay measurement, that MTU, and um, authentication. Authentication is done uh, in uh, extension so that it can be applied as needed basis versus comparing to how it's defined, for example, for uh, BFD protocol, that's if uh, the mode is authenticated that each and every control message expected to be uh, authenticated. The timer negotiation mechanism is a well-known mechanism used in BFD uh, when each of uh, participants of the test session advertises um, their interval that it wants to send message and expects message to be uh, received. So uh, that allows uh, balance between uh, parties, peers in the test and um, protects it from uh, being uh, overrun or attacked. Uh, next slide, please. Authentication capability. Authentication capability uh, expects to be um, extensible. And uh, each of their uh, parties advertises uh, what it's capable of supporting. Uh, that can be identified based on um, bit field. And then each of them uh, selects uh, the strongest authentication method supported by uh, all parties and then can be used. Next slide, please. So uh, this um, diagram uh, reflects how uh, negotiation for the lightweight authentication uh, is expected to work. So there is a negotiation phase, and then there is an authentication phase. And next slide, please. Uh, authentication uh, uses uh, the TLV extension and includes a uh, variable um, length uh, HMAC field, so, uh, and uh, the length of the HMAC is something that uh, parties can uh, negotiate during their capability negotiation phase. Next slide. Uh, performance monitoring in the integrated OEM, uh, it's a uh, using the constructs defined in RFC 6374, MPLS, packet loss and delay uh, measurement. And that supports synthetic one-way and synthetic two-way, as well as direct loss measurement, packet delay measurement, um, one-way and two-way. And we are adding uh, packet MTU discovery uh, using uh, padding TOV. Next slide, please. So um, their uh, path MTU uh, discovery monitoring operation it needs to be um, more detail specific. Uh, we are, uh, welcome your comments, suggestion, and question. Yes, Rakesh. Uh, while Rakesh is coming up, there's a question from Tony Pran that not to forget replay protection. A comment, not a question. Yeah, hi, hi Greg. Um, so um, there is a similar draft in the BFD working group. Uh, it's a draft Mirmin BFD extended. How does this relate to that work in the BFD working group? Uh, this, this draft replaced it. 
Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's not clear by combining the RFC 6374 and BFD taking pieces from two. Um, not sure what requirements are being addressed because um, this was discussed in the BFD working group and um, the extensions of control protocol um, 46374 using BFD. Um, it, it wasn't clear what were the requirements that we we're trying to address. Uh, well, I, I tried to uh, explain it in the first. So um, first of all, uh, it's a reducing number of OEM protocols that needs to be uh, supported. Uh, second of all, why it's around um, lightweight protocol because um, lightweight path continuity protocol uh, support like BFD um, enables us uh, to do um, many sessions at high interval rate while the performance measurement does not really require high uh, rate uh, usually. So um, again, uh, if you look at the uh, document, so it goes into uh, explanation of motivation uh, in more details. I don't want to just read the document uh, here again out loud. But yeah, so um, there, there is some interest because um, uh, in other applications uh, like uh, Rift, we talked about uh, with the community and uh, it already provides uh, infrastructure that uh, supports um, path uh, continuity. Uh, and uh, it might be nice feature to complement it uh, with the performance uh, monitoring uh, when system uh, discovers uh, their uh, topology. Yeah, there is a uh, work um, uh, going on in Spring um, and IPPM. Uh, in Spring specifically, there is enhanced Rakesh, you are not, uh, your voice disappears. We could, sorry, uh, so we could um, probably present this work in other working group and get the, uh, uh, compare with other work happening in other working groups. Um, yes, uh, I understand that you uh, refer to uh, SRPM uh, work. Um, I just want to point that SRPM, as I understand it, it's built around STEM protocol. Um, STEM protocol is a performance monitoring uh, mechanism, and uh, it's quite heavy. So it's definitely too heavy for uh, being uh, considered as a lightweight path continuity. So I really doubt that it was not, okay, it was not designed to be a path continuity and perform at um, high rate, like 3.3 milliseconds. Um, and as such, I think it's not the best choice as a base for uh, integrated OEM solution. Uh, that's why what we are proposing, we are proposing a different approach um, to this problem. Um, I think that, and I I'm really appreciate that you're uh, interested in this work because um, what we are doing, though we're trying to solve it differently, it's uh, to me, it's an indication that there is an interest and there is a real need to do the um, to have an integrated OEM solution. But definitely let's discuss which approach is more practical and uh, realistic. Chen Li? Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Did, 
do you really uh, do, do you uh, plan to extend the PFD for the whole thing like protection OEM PM something like this is it correct um, it's yes uh, okay thank you um, it's not really an extension of BFD so what we are proposing here would not be on top of existing BFD um, for now looking more like a new protocol that inherits best uh, features of BFD and mechanisms like for example uh, negotiation using a uh, poll sequence and some of their structure but I would not really refer that as this is an extended BFD and that's why when we started this work and uh, to remove um, some confusion we marked this document as replacing this uh, document that we had earlier uh, and uh, named it extended BFD so their resulting protocol in our opinion will have a lot of uh, functional similarities with BFD but would not be an extension of BFD per se mm -hmm. got you thank you and by the way we will have another solution called IPv6 ACH and it will be presented later thank you Villa? so you have this algorithm negotiation for a security and that's not authenticated so isn't it vulnerable to downgrade attack especially because you have the SHA one which is not secure anymore as one of the options the draft says you don't have to accept no authentication but at least somebody who could get to the link and send a lot of negotiation packets would downgrade it downgrade the authentication to SHA one so might be better not to negotiate the authentication. Um, well, again, so this is uh, early and we appreciate your comments and um, recommendations, suggestions. So we're open to uh, discussion. Let's do it on the list and it will be great. Um, Again, uh, we are looking, comparing with their mechanisms that have been used in um, so far in um, protocols and they, there are other all based on configuration. So we think that being able to con uh, negotiate because uh, different nodes, um, parts of the network can be upgraded at different level uh is a more flexible approach but definitely uh your suggestion of having some uh mandatory security uh that that's if if i understand you correctly i i think that that's probably the right way we need just agree what is the mandatory security authentication uh level that has to be supported by all nodes that support this specification. Jeff. Hi, Jeff. I was speaking uh, as one of the BFD chairs. Um, it, it's worth noting that uh, we had long conversations with Greg uh, about could we put this inside a BFD? <clears throat> and you know, Greg uh, in his slides makes a good point that, uh, you know, what we're doing is we're leveraging BFD-like mechanisms. You know, the, the properties that are sort of liked uh, by Greg for BFD is being able to carry out, uh, carry information from one system to another in a periodic fashion. Uh, we do know that BFD is capable of doing that in terms of its protocol machinery, but you know, we're sort of diluting the, the core mission of BFD in terms of providing continuity checks at speed. So we did suggest uh, Greg actually leverage the mechanisms from BFD uh, for you know, his new mechanism. So it, it, to some extent to answer fan's question in the queue, uh, we did discuss putting this in the BFD. It's not a great fit, uh, at least in terms of the core protocol, 
but we're quite happy to see you know the mechanism uh, mechanisms that BFD is popularized carried into the rest of IETF for other purposes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, oh, sorry, sorry, Chair. I don't know if, if I'm permitted to ask a question. Ah, uh, yes, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. So I, I I get a clarification uh, um, from uh, from the from pe previous um, comment. So uh, I also have another question that um, I I see you mentioned the past MTU discovery and the monitoring here. So I don't know if why, uh, if it, there is any uh, use case that um, to use a protocol like um, OAM protocol to do this kind of, uh, to do this um, pass MTU discovery and monitoring um, uh, work? Um, well, um, normally uh, this uh, task is part of OAM uh, functionality um, whether it's done using on-demand tool like uh, ICMP uh, or whether it's done differently for example uh, there is a proposal in beer uh, path uh, MTU discovery in beer that uh, uses um, LSP ping extension so um here um it could be done either on demand and i'm kind of like um thinking right now uh, on my feet uh using a poll sequence or it could be done um, uh, periodically um, and uh in bfd we do have a uh document that uh, quite advanced uh, because there is a need uh, from their uh, operators to monitor the path MTU because path MTU uh, on a tunnel can change in course of the operation. So I do believe that uh, path MTU discovery is a part of a uh, function that is um, OEM responsibility. Of course, it could be done differently, but uh, OEM can be used as well. Okay, sure. Uh, since you mentioned beer, um, I, I also want to have a follow-up question that um, if uh, if the, all these um, functions are, um, are uh, if if the functions of this in, in OAM um, will, um, I mean, uh, what 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 kind of uh, what data what data plane uh, do you plan to use this in OAM protocol there? Because uh, you mentioned beer, is that only mm -hmm. in the beer or what what other uh, data plane do you have? The excellent mind? question. Thank you. I really appreciate you asking the question. Um, for now, uh, so this, um, our goal is first to define the core uh, protocol and then uh, make it uh, applicable to all data planes. Um, again, uh, I can point to the uh, experience uh, with the BFD, that BFD successfully being uh, applied to MPLS IP. Uh, there is an um, explanation of using uh, BFD in beer, and this is more of a point, point to multi point uh, flavor of BFD. So, or it's uh, uh, BFD, uh, there are two RFCs BFD for multi point networks. So, uh, and so I this I wanted protocol. I want to interrupt here a little bit. Um, we, we need to sort of close the discussion after Rakesh. So I would say uh -huh. let's, uh, you could respond to, yeah. to, you know, provide those pointers on the list. Uh, we'll let right. Rakesh uh, ask his final question and then we'll move on to the next presentation after you've had a quick of response to that. Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, Greg, one comment is um, that with um, 
automation and controller and uh, SDN um, are fairly advanced these days. Um, the, we, you know, doing less and less control plane um, uh, signaling and extensions to uh, simplify the control plane. Uh, so uh, I think the simple TWAMP is a perfect example of um, how controller can be used for such use cases. Uh, so here, you know, this um, signaling extensions uh, a bit uh, going in a different direction. No, I don't believe so, because uh, the control plane is basically the advantage of STAMP uh, comparing to the TWAMP is stamp configuration uh, can be done for the controller using yang based data models uh, i don't see that there is anything precluding to have yang data model for integrated oem protocol and then use a centralized controller to instantiate test sessions uh, whether proactive or on demand uh, as operator desires. So I don't see any uh, contradiction between the model STEM can be used in um, network automation versus how integrated uh, OEM proposal uh, protocol can be used. So, uh, but yeah, let's take it to the list and continue discussion on the list. I, I think that will be better for everybody. Yeah, there are a number of questions, especially with regards to BFD plus extensions. Please send to the list, and I believe Greg would be happy addressing them. Uh, Mike? Thank Greg. Hi. Uh, hi there. I'm working on getting, uh, getting your slides up in full screen mode. Just... Uh, Give me a moment. Okay, they should be stable. Thanks. You look good. Thank you. So this is a um, <clears throat> this is a problem that's looking for a uh, solution, which may or may not already exist. Um, the drafts that are grayed out there are drafts that we've been working on for a couple years now um, under the IRTF within the COIN research group. Um, and we've, and we, we as um, Eve Schooler, Diego Lopez, Dirk Hoosier, Xavier Defoy, and myself, we've been working on a series of drafts to describe this problem of locating and capturing data in a standardized way. Um, <clears throat> and so if you go to the uh, next slide, um, it, I'll talk a little bit more about the history of this, but so we, we've had these, um, we had these documents to describe the, the problem and and now we have some use cases. And so this is the first time that we're jumping the pond to come to the IETF to kind of describe uh, the problem and see if there's um, a reason to be able to create a, a, a new solution if there's not already solutions that exist. And, it, and this did evolve out, out of a series of edge computing side meetings that we held. And one of the gaps that we identified from these side meetings is um, edge data discovery. And so our problem space isn't edge specific, but it developed out of being edge specific because it's kind of easier to see the problem in that regard where you want to find data from edge data edit, edge databases um, and be able to uh, consolidate it, to find it and make some use out of it. And that data can be distributed uh, throughout the edge. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, So again, the problem that we are trying to define is locating distributed data in a standardized way in order to perform sort of some sort of networking actions. There are ways to find data uh, using AD AWS solutions, Google has solutions, there's a variety of SQL, NoSQL, database ways to uh, locate data. Um, you can have orchestrated container solutions that allow you to locate data, but um, we're looking for this to be more of a dynamic, uh, non-provisioned -pre way to 
uh, locate data. Um, <clears throat> and that data may be cached uh, and stored throughout you know, multiple locations. And it needs to be marshaled to be able to feed a particular function. Um, and so to that point is why we've been working on this within the, the coin RG, the computing in the network RG, to just kind of um, kind of further develop this idea. Uh, sometimes the nature of the computation is determined on the fly based upon context and which algorithm to perform can be an on-demand decision. So as far as we're aware, there's no standards-based solution to discover where databases exist throughout a network and where specific data objects are located. And so the location of each data store is a first level discovery problem. And then the details of the database is a second level discovery problem. Next slide. So data, it, this is, you know, obviously a very broad concept, but we're focusing on, you know, data can be a program, a service, uh, a resource, and we have a variety of use cases that kind of helps describe using that. And it can involve statistics, measurements, temperature, location, metadata, health records, whatever it may be. Um, <clears throat> so services, you can have a firewall and you may want to be able to find a specific type of a firewall that has certain security aspects or some other <clears throat> requirements um, and be able to find that and then be able to utilize that. And that could also include finding, you know, CPU capabilities as well as memory. Next slide. Okay, so one of the use cases that we developed, and I'll try to quickly go through these, um, is being able to, um, uh, when you have a SFC enabled domain, you have a variety of service functions and <clears throat> along a, a potential service path, excuse me. And the data capabilities of those devices, those service functions, it would be helpful to have them discoverable in order to steer applications based upon app requirements. Um, they, you know, it, we've, we've heard from um, this week about using APN. And so it's kind of along the same concepts and it, and it's not only APN, there's some solutions outside of the IETF um, like W3C that are finding, uh, doing some research on application hints to the network about things that they want to declare the, the, the network to do. And, and part of that may be to um, find certain data. And so the data to be discovered in this particular instance is resources that can help a local application perform a particular task and then um, data which needs to be searched and discovered to be able to provide a result to be acted upon by the application. And since this is FSC, I think Joel has a question. Yeah. Yeah, because the, uh, the description you've given confuses me. On the one hand, there's already a proposal for how to do SFC service function discovery or service function knowledge for it if you're using a distributed system, but it's aimed at making sure that the classifiers know where the SFs are, not about external discovery, because fundamentally, SFC is designed for cases where the application, the ex thing external to the classifier function, is not choosing the service functions. They're also, everybody's already using lots of mechanisms whereby controllers can just, which generally stand up the service functions anyway, can discover the service functions. So this problem feels like it's already well attacked and I have trouble with it as an example, understanding what problem you're really trying to solve. Yeah, so it may be, and we've, we've talked about, you know, uh, punting to a controller to just, you know, let the controller take care of, you know, providing whatever service function that you need to uh, to provide. Um, it, and if there's already a solution to providing data capabilities of devices um, uh, to applications, then um, that's great. Then we need to, to make a note of that. Maybe we can leverage that for other OR use cases. Is that what you're saying, that that particular application has already been solved? This, 
to the degree that I understand the discovery problem in service function chaining, I won't say it's solved completely. I mean, there's always room for improvements, but it doesn't need a whole new tack on the problem. It seems to be fall well within several different domains that we know work for this problem. Okay, Jim. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to respond, Joel, just quickly. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I'm aware of the the, uh, the service function discovery documents and stuff as um, that you mentioned, but I think what Mike's trying to do here is just give an example of, um, you know, what type of data are we talking about? Um, and SFC is obviously one of those, but there are many others. And um, you know, maybe this was a bad, uh, not a bad, but maybe it wasn't the right. Um, yeah. uh, example to use, but 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 it kind of gives a picture that look, there's there's data around there, whether it be you know a particular uh, data store or whether it be a a function that's got particular characteristics of it, and we'd like to be able to discover that dynamically. So that's really the problem space. Okay, let me be clear. I I get that there's a general I need to discover functions and information about them, and I'm whether that falls into the IETF's purview or not when they're really applications is a whole different debate and I wasn't trying to go there. But SFC, because the information is who has to discover it and who has to know it is so specialized, seems like a bad example. And so I was really struck by yeah. the example. I'm not objecting to the underlying problem space that Mike is talking about. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Tight. Uh, let's go to the next use case then. All right, so it, it could also be that uh, applications need to discover um, you know, server memory and compute re resources that are available in order to steer packets towards them. Uh, one of the side meetings that happened this week <clears throat> was Dynecast, which I thought was pretty interesting which is <clears throat> trying to discover ways that you can dynamically steer traffic to the best resource in order to find what that best resource is, it would be helpful to be able to um, uh, have data provided that uh, gives information about, you know, the, the clock speeds and, you know, the amount of CPU cores that are available um, in order to, in their use case, be able to have rendering tasks diverted to those resources, including traffic and compute offloading. So this is a another potential area where um, we have data that needs to be discovered about um, these particular resources in order to steer, steer packets toward them. But there needs to be some sort of a feedback mechanism uh, to be able to provide that information. Next use case. Okay, and this also can be included uh, in a, you know, executing a process. So uh, in a supply chain type of an environment, um, let's say it's either trucks or on a conveyor belt in a, a factory. Uh, if you have something that needs to stay, stay at a certain temperature, let's say a vaccine, and if there's an anomaly to that, if all that data is being sent somewhere, uh, maybe to the edge or some other database, and there's an anomaly of a temperature that's not meeting the requirements, um, uh, it needs real-time measurement data, such as in this case, temperature to execute a particular process. So if that data is searchable uh, and discoverable quickly, um, you can steer that in this case vaccine to a new path to get to a hospital or somewhere where it can be used very quickly and not go to waste and so um, and this can be used in a variety of types of process execution uh, next slide uh, the itf loves to hate blockchain and distributed ledgers but there is an effort uh, that is going on uh, and there's a list blockchain dash interop at itf.org that Thomas is uh, leading and he's on this draft that I'm discussing right now as well and he wrote up this use case. Um, the, the effort that 
uh, is happening right now is being able to find interoperability between different distributed ledgers, which right now doesn't exist. And so there's a new protocol that's called ODAP, ODAP that is um, being proposed to be able to have gateway to gateway interoperability. But um, aside from that, we're, we're thinking that it's potentially a use case where you could need to be able to find data back in some one of these distributed ledgers, you know, whether it's an asset or you know an actual Bitcoin or whatever, um, and be able to have that discoverable. Um, and so that's also we think a potential use case of trying to find that data and make and be able to have the network assist in being able to find where that data is. Next next slide. And then lastly, and this is where it all started, is with edge computing. Uh, there was a variety of use cases, including using an elevator. So elevator data is you know, being collected on these um, different elevators and different floors with regards to vibration, temperature, speed, brakes, or whatever. Um, and it would be good if that data is um, discoverable in order for the network and in conjunction with the app to take an action, uh, whether it is with regards to predictive maintenance or maybe in an emergency situation where you're able to quickly um, identify a particular problem uh, with a speed and be able to make a quick action on that and being able to have that data discovered because that data of these elevators could be stored again in a variety of places on the edge and we just may not know where to find it. Um, in OT worlds, they have their own contained uh, solutions, proprietary solutions that allow them to build to provide that information. But when you open it up to IP, then there's some new opportunities there. Next slide. So this is the last slide. So um, we, as I mentioned, have some problems that we've described. This draft is just trying to describe use cases that as clear as we can, and it, there's there's still uh, work uh, improvement that needs to be done. But um, the next step, and this is why we're here, is would to be to work on data discovery solutions, uh, either using existing technologies and protocols. Um, you know, PubSub is certainly one uh, option, and that's what is oftentimes used in the OT world. But I think we need something more robust than the existing solutions, but maybe they need to be extended. It may be silly to think about using DNS and BGP, but um, you know, why not? Everybody else is extending them. So maybe there's there's an opportunity there. Um, and then just see if there needs to be some protocol extensions or a new protocol needed. Or maybe as Joel kind of pointed out, maybe in some use cases, it's there's already work being done and we just need to maybe expand that a bit. And so, you know, we. If, if, the, if this is a valid area that we should work on, then we, we think here may be the best place to do so. Otherwise, we'll continue to um, work on it within the IRTF. Uh, any questions? Yeah, uh, supporting group chair, I, I read all the drafts and they seem to be a bit ocean boiling. I mean, all the data needs to be discovered by everybody, which is, you know, not very meaningful. So the question to you, you are in routing area and routing working group. Uh, do you plan to narrow down your use cases that they're relevant to routing specifically and at least identify I know, consumers, publishers, and you know, I mean, how is it relevant to routing in general? Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, it's being that the next step would be to start thinking about um, a particular one of these many use cases and a particular set of problems or just a particular problem being that we're starting to consider the solution part of this this is why we're here and so maybe there are some routing aspects to this that need to be need to be developed or maybe not and so um, that next step you know at the end of this ITF we're going to start you know evaluating now like you know what would be some solutions that would be able to satisfy a particular problem that we've identified. And so um, we're looking for some feedback from this working group. So before I pass it to Jeff, uh, what I was trying to say is not solutions actually narrow down your problem statement because it's too generic and I mean, 
we are happy in routing working group to provide a place to talk about new problems, new solutions, but it needs to be to narrow down to a particular set that is routing. Uh, just yeah, and that's understood. And that's kind of what I was trying to say. And it probably it just depends upon which way you want to go. It's um, being that we're going to start thinking about, you know, what solution may help solve uh, one of these problems. I think that will help us narrow down the scope as we as we start thinking about what some of the available solutions that exist are. So the answer is yes, we're going to start narrowing it down and seeing where if and where this may be able to be benefited by a routing protocol or that a routing protocol can help solve. Jeff? As Juniper. Uh, so I, I tend to agree with prior comments that uh, this is trying to boil you know, very large sets of oceans. But uh, the two general oceans that I think are the interesting ones are you're, you're looking at a general uh, directory slash discovery service to figure out what are the interesting things I want to get. And over your use cases, you're getting the, you know, once I've decided I'm interested in something, how do I actually get it in an efficient fashion that uh, makes sense for the, uh, the data? You know, is it something that needs to be sequenced reliable? Uh, is it something that I'm willing to get a periodic unreliable telemetry stream for? And certainly the second piece of things is where IETF has you know, good technologies for that sort of thing. Um, we don't really have the sort of uh, dump truck uh, subscription directory. Uh, a thing from past history that I have uh, very cursory exposure to is Corba, uh, where you have basically objects in the system that you may want to get state for, and a directory mechanism was created to be able to get to the stuff and to publish that you have such things. So I, I think that uh, directory stuff may or may not itself be within the context of IETF. Um, the other items, you have to decide what the properties are you want and decide if you actually have good distribution mechanisms that are fits for technologies we already have. OK. OK, thanks, Mike. Uh, Fang Young, your turn. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And this is Fan Yang from Huawei. And in this draft, uh, I oh yes, uh, in this draft we introduce uh, an associated channel over IPv6. And for short, we name this associated channel as ACH, uh, and we limit the scope to IPv6 networks. Next, please. Yeah. Um, the higher level motivation here that we see from IPv4 to MPRS and from MPRS to IPv6, um, the IPv6 provide the connectivities in many cases, many uh, new uh, use cases, including the uh, legacy networks, and also there's new emerging use, uh, use cases. And for in, in all these scenarios that we recognize that IP services requires higher quality of LSA guarantee. And we see uh, segment routing over IPv6 provide the optimized route for service forwarding uh, via the routing programming ca capability on SRH. And so this ACH is proposed uh, to provide the control and management programming capabilities. Um, uh, for for the service forwarding, and uh, later we will have some examples at uh, at the end of this slides and uh, to show the uh, uh, applica applicability, <laughs> applica applicability. Yeah, next please. Um, see here that uh, and this uh, this slide in, uh, describes the architecture of the ACH and in middle of uh, and uh, there is a cloud in middle and it shows the, it is the IPv6 network and the the black line between the first node and fourth node uh, represents the IP pass and user data will uh, use data is transmitted along this IP pass in the yellow arrow and you see the blue arrows are the as associated channel created to the IP pass. And 
uh, sorry. And we see um, in the in the right bottom graph, and it shows where this ACH uh, is where where this ACH is in one network node, and the control plane, control and management plane generated generates the control and management messages, and it it is in ah uh, sorry. And it, it is carried uh, in the associate channel and transmitted in the data plane. So to sum up, the ACH is a control channel and it is a, an associate channel to an IP forwarding pass. It carries the messages of the control and uh, management protocol, protocols to provide the control and management functions. Next, please. Yeah, in this draft, we specify the ACH as a TLV format, and the type specified uh, it is a control channel for one specific specific IP pass. The channel type specifies the type of the control or management protocol. To identify the pass, to identify the IP pass, and also uh, uh, associate the IP pass to the ACH, um, an uh, associate channel ID is specified. And in the and the messages of the control or, or management protocols are carried in the fixed message field. And since it is a TLV format, so this ACH TLV can be kept encapsulated in IPv6 extension headers, and it can also be encapsulated in as a payload in a synthetic packet. And later I will give. Uh, Two um, two examples to explain the applications to the to explain the end to end and hop by hop applications. Next, please. Okay, the, the first use case is we we call it unified OEM. Um, here we give a uh, uh, three OE, we list uh, three protocols of uh, used for the OEM functions, and we also identify there are uh, pro there are several problems there, because different protocols are fulfilled different OEM functions, but they also have uh, functions overlapped, and all of this they use the independent session identifiers, and they are deeply. Uh, they are deeply encapsulated in IP uh, in IP packet. Um, if there is if there is uh, there is any uh, intermediate node on the pass, um, they are not sensed. They are not aware by the end to end sessions OEM sessions. So here we try to come up with a simple solution to carry the different OEM fun uh, uh, OEM messages in ACH. In the IP layer and also in the in a uniform way, and the advantage is to use reduce the amount, uh, the number of the OEM protocols and reduce the the number of the sessions, and also unify the session identifier. The figure below shows there uh, it is uh, there is a end to end uh, end to end OEM uh, end to end ACH how 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 and. ACH uh, TLV is used for the end-to-end -end session. Um, here, there is a delay measurement delay measurement type of ACH TLV is is encapsulated in the IPv6 DOH header, and this E2E should be replaced with DOH. And with uh, with the ACH uh, with the ACH associated chat, uh, ID, um, and when when R4 receive this packet. Uh, and the ACH will be mm, receive this packet, and the and ACH um, it uh, it will process the ACH TLV to measure the delay, the packet delay. Uh, next, please. And the second use case um, actually used uh, two associate channel here as uh, channels here um, when. And the first, ch the first um, uh, so ACH channel um, a is is used between uh, from R1 to R4. So R1 generates a fault management a type ACH TLV and encapsulated in the IPv6 hop by hop uh, extension header. 
so in this way that um, it um, the the every node on this IP pass will be uh, uh, will uh, process this a uh, ACHTLV. And for example, if there is an error be, uh, detected on our R3 node, and when R3 node um, process this ACHTLV, it will be up, it will update the the ACHTLV to set the flag of this arrow uh, to indicate this arrow and send to R4. And on R4, it, it will use another ACHTLV to to indicate this um, indicate this uh, fault or this arrow back to R1 to ask for the switchover of this uh, of this uh, uh, of this um, I, uh, of this uh, user data forwarding. And the second, the second uh, ACH is uh, actually should be uh, it is used for the end-to-end, -end, uh, uh, used for the end-to-end -end, uh, session because this, uh, this, um, this, um, yeah, yes. And that, next, please. Okay, I, I wanted to point out there's someone in the queue, so you can choose to take his question or, or wait. It's up to you. But I just wanted to point out that Greg is in the queue. Yeah, no, it's okay. Okay, Please, go ahead, Greg. Greg. Sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, what in the previous slide being uh, presented, it looks uh, as a, a combination of uh, two processes. First is uh, failure detection end to end and second is um, protection switch over coordination um, using uh, RDI functionality remote uh, defect indicator so and this is not a new problem and th this has been pr uh, solved uh, specifically um, using combination BFD and uh, protection switch over coordination protocol um, already. So that's one note. But my uh, general question is um, other one, that uh, UDP is becoming a predominant transport. So why not OEM on UDP transport and why you're proposing to do it on IP because it's not guaranteed that uh, IP and UDP will be uh, transported in the same manner and they will experience uh, the same treatment from the network. Um, yeah, uh, I will first to answer the first question. Um, you, you mentioned that there, yeah, I, I understand what you have described, um, but there is one case that the, um, the BFD and uh, the its RDI uh, indication is not uh, is not exactly in, uh, soft. Is um, if this error is not a failure of this link, is it, if this error is just a, a signal degradation, so there will be uh, there's not there's no um, if there is only the signal degradation, so the BFD cannot. Um, um, one hundred percent to detect this this function, uh, detect this arrow. So that is uh, actually um, this arrow. With uh, this case is the the case that we think that it's, the current it's, it's, protocol it's, okay. cannot solve. Uh, it, it's it's great that you mentioned this scenario. So basically, um, what's uh, in uh, constant bit rate uh, uh, media uh, called. Um, Errored seconds or severely errored seconds. Uh, I hope I will have a presentation time um, in IPPM working group, which is in parallel to RTGVG. I don't invite everybody to switch there, uh, but it's uh, been scheduled, and uh, you can look at uh, individual draft in IPPM working group on error performance uh, uh, measurement. And that addresses, uh, I believe, your scenario. So basically, um, in combination of uh, how 
network failure, packet loss, and delay can be combined together and uh, expressed as a single metric. Uh, okay, um, thank you for the pointer. I think I will look into it, and maybe we we uh, we can better discuss it in the mailing list later. Yeah. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, after we send this uh, draft, we update this draft, and we receive some comments. And I want to give the feedback to the comments. And that first, we we first uh, borrow this. Yes, we borrow this idea from the MPS GSAH, and also the second is we define this uh, this ACH ingress node and the egress node, and so this ACH TRV will be encapsulated in at the ingress node. Uh, that is that means the first first node of the IP, IP forwarding uh, IP pass. So th there will be no um, uh, no uh, confliction to the RFC uh, 8200. Uh, 82 yes, and um, currently the scope is defined to, for IPv6. Um, maybe uh, they, they, uh, there are some suggestions that we, we could start to uh, focusing on the uh, on the ACA, how ACH can be used for on as RV6. So I will, we will consider this. Um, yes, the ACH is de uh, designed at, uh, for IP layer and encapsulate in IP layer. Yeah, I think I will also um, uh, reply this, uh, the, the reply this uh, question uh, from Greg in the mailing list later. Next, please. Yeah, the next step will refine this draft um, based on the comments and suggestions, and um, maybe um, yeah, and start the application. Uh, start to uh, specify the how the applications used uh, by used in uh, by AC, by ACH. Yes, used in with ACH. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, that's it. Okay, uh, thank you. If there are, we'll give a moment for anyone to come to the, the mic for questions, but. Okay, uh, thanks. Shall we move on to uh, Cheng Li presenting? There have been a number of comments and some discussion on the, on the chat. Please take a look. Mostly comparison to FTP, but for educational purposes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay. So basically, uh, my topic today is about IPv6 based cloud oriented networking, and we call it CON. Next, please. Hello. Next. Um, so I, I've advanced the slide. It shows motivation on top. I'm not sure if it's reached you yet. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I get it right now. So okay, uh, thanks. The the motivation, yeah, the motivation of uh, why uh, we propose IPv6 based CON is that. Uh, as you know, with the development of uh, cloud computing, right, the connections between the, the, the enterprise network side and the cloud, especially like the third party uh, uh, public cloud, are added. So it would introduce some new uh, requirements and act, uh, and challenges for uh, to the existing networks. And as you can see, that uh, uh, the draft net to cloud uh, problem statement have uh, has. Uh, uh, described some uh, problems and challenges that the existing network facing today of how to handle the interconnection between the, 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 the enterprise uh, branch offices and the uh, uh, third party clouds uh, with the uh, uh, dynamic workloads uh, in their VPN, right? 
and also in this document we we, we also describe some extra challenges such as uh, as we know that if you are using the option a in the inter as right it's it is really hard uh, like to configure the uh, vpn right so uh the second one is that if we are using the vxlan to connect the uh, different branches and as you know, we cannot specify the uh, underlay for what we pause because the VXLAN is only like overlay uh, protocol, right? So the strict TE requirements like the deterministic delay and, and like specific pass forwarding, something like this, they cannot be guaranteed, right? So uh, in order to address this kind of uh, issues, we propose IPv6 based uh, cloud uh, oriented networking so in this document we uh describe the challenge of uh, of the networks facing today and we also list the requirements that ipv6 based uh, CON should satisfy uh, satisfy and we, we also list some like candidate solutions yeah next please so all of all uh ipv6 based CON is a networking uh, uh architecture that uh First of all, it, it is a IPv6 based networking, right? And secondly, it is designed for the cloud. Yeah. So this slide describes the problem state statement of the uh, existing network. Basically, we have two parts of uh, this slide. The, the first one is the underlay. And as you can see from the uh, uh, figure one, we uh, uh, drop a, a typical uh, a telco cloud uh, topo topology right here. We have uh, edge DC, we have uh, remote uh, region DC, and we have core DC, something like this. And how to deploy the quick connection from end to end, even travel multiple like data center. Uh, it's a really, uh, uh, how say, critical uh, issue for us right now. And sometimes we need to deploy like service function chaining within the like HDC or, or the GI lane, something like this. So, uh, you know, it's really hard to support SFC in the uh, Paris networking right now. And regarding the overlay uh, part, uh, we, we, we uh, describe a typical uh, scenario, which is SD1, right? In SD1 scenarios, sometimes we will use the VXLAN to uh, connect different like signs and uh, between the uh, pop gateway, something like this. But in this case, the strict like this kind of requirements cannot be uh, satisfied, right? So next. Uh, uh, some delay, right? So this kind of uh, requirements uh, are listed in the draft. The for, like a uh, quick connection, hybrid network connection, pass programming, something like that. Let that list, right? And uh, as you can see, uh, resource assurance and service function chaining, performance measurements, they should be uh, supported in IPv6 based CON, right? Next. So in order to uh, 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 satisfy this kind of uh, requirements, we also list some uh, candidate uh, solutions uh, in this kind of uh, aspect or uh, use case, like VPN, uh, pass programming, service function chaining, uh, and network slicing, and on pass measurements, and reliability, security, something like this. Next. And I will go uh, really quick uh, to go through the uh, whole uh, requirements and solutions to, to make a quick picture for us, uh, for, for all of us, right? So for quick connection, as you know, the uh, clouds were located in any location around the world. So, and, and the people would try to connect the cloud in anywhere, anytime. So we need to provide quick connection between this kind of like VPN sites so VPN uh, SRV6 may be a like good candidate uh, solution, right? Next. So this is about a hybrid net 
network connection. Uh, as you know, that uh, the uh, uh, connection between the clouds and the enterprise sites may travel multiple uh, types of networks, such as IPv4 and MPRS and, and, and SRV6, IPv6, something like this. So we have to support end-to-end -end, like IPv6 uh, forwarding at least. And if possible, if we can support end-to-end -end SRV6 uh, forwarding, that would be best, right? And in order to in interworking and with uh, between those kind of uh, different uh, type of networks, uh, we we need solutions for uh, a stitch the uh, pause between like SRV6 domain and SRMPS domain and IPv4 domain something like this, and GSRV6 uh, provide a candidate pause. Uh, no, 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 a can candidate uh, solution for addressing this kind of uh, solution. Yep. Next. Yeah, pass programming. We, we don't need to say too much. Like we need the uh, the traffic to go to to be uh, forwarded following the uh, specified pass. Yeah. So candidate solution could be like SRV6 or SRM Pierce, but in this draft we we, we say that uh, we we need SRV6 because it is IPv6 uh, based networking. Next. Yeah, uh, regarding the resource assurance, we think uh, network uh, slicing uh, uh, mechanisms are really needed, such as VPN plus. Yeah, maybe we can add more uh, solutions into this draft. So, and then this uh, draft is really a beginning of the draft. So we need more comments and we need more contributions and welcome. Yep, next. Yeah, this is about uh, that uh, deterministic delay. As you as you know, w some applications need the uh, really low latency, right? So the solution could be like DeathNet or TSN, sorry for the typo. Yep, <laughs> next. Yeah, this is about service function chaining, and typically the SFC can be deployed without, uh, within the uh, cloud data center or the GLN uh, data center, something like this, right? So we think the SRV6 based or IPv6 based SFC have to be uh, uh, supported within the IPv6 based uh, CLN, right? Next. Yeah, so performance measurement is the basic requirement of any network. So there's nothing special here. And we suggest to use the uh, in-band uh, PM or uh, on pass PM, anything you, you can call it. And and for example, like IPv6 alternative, uh, alternate uh, marking or I fit IOM, something like this, yeah. Next. So this part is about the reliability. We list some uh, solutions such as uh, BFD for end-to-end uh, -end protection and FR for local uh, protection, like the midpoint protection, egress protection, something like this. And we also, uh, as you can see that we have some work of uh, redundancy protection. So we also include this kind of uh, protection mechanism in this draft. Yep, next. Linda, I will go through the whole uh, slides very quick and you can ask later. Yeah, thank you. And this part is about security, nothing new here. And I think we should not introduce any new kind of uh, security issues, threats into the uh, uh, CON. Yep, next. Yeah, this part is about the forwarding efficiency. It, it, it is really important because, you know, in the uh, multi-tenant uh, scenarios, the tenants will run, uh, like, for example, a, a lean slide, right? In this case, the forwarding efficiency for the tenants will be very, like, important, critical, right? So we provide two... Uh, uh, dimensions of uh, uh, 
uh, solutions to address the uh, forwarding efficiency issues. Uh, the first one is we have to uh, discuss uh, uh, di discover the uh, pass MTU along the pass, so we can set the appropriate uh, 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 MTU for the uh, packet, right? And the second part is that if we are using the SRV6 for uh, forwarding, the compression mechanism should be applied, such as GSRV6. And by the way, we have uh, over 10 uh, vendors has ha have support GSRV6, GSRV6 right now, and you can see more news in the near future. Yep. Next. So the last one is application aware networking. Uh, yeah, in IPv6 based CON, we we will have many types of application traffic, right? So they uh, they will have uh, various uh, queues requirements. So we should provide uh, five granted. Uh, how say, uh, five granted uh, uh, traffic steering mechanism for this kind. Uh, yeah, 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 for the traffic. So we 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 add APN six as a candidate uh, solution here. And if you have more like kind of solutions, welcome to discuss with us. Yeah, next. Yep, last next step. Welcome. Welcome to comments, Linda, and, and we, we, are re, we're, we are looking for more collaboration on this draft because it, it, it is really a, a beginning of this draft. And if you have more uh, mechanisms, solutions, welcome to contribute to the, to the draft. Yep. Thank you. Next it would be thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. So I have a couple of comments. Um, it seems to be this draft covers a lot of things and it seems that all the network technology developed by IETF is under uh, this scope, okay? But I feel it's too big. Maybe it's better to break the draft into some smaller ones. For example, um, when we talk about um, cloud uh, oriented networking right so if we talk about public cloud then you bound to have longer distance because public cloud data centers are far apart from the enterprise and that technology needed for that is quite different from like say um, edge computing like for example in the 5g edge computing environment where the um, mini data centers, what well, they also call cloud, um, are very close to each other. So it's a local data network, it's a smaller domain. Um, like for mission critical applications, you may need that net to be in place to, to guarantee the, the delivery, right? And so that with each domain, yeah, yeah, um, different domains, you may need apply different things in there to make it the draft more concrete. Um, Okay, this is this particular domain. For this domain, we need technology one, two, three, four. For the other one, we need three, four, five, six, something like that. I think it will be better, easier to yeah. focus. Yeah. yeah, excellent suggestion. We'll follow up with you. Yeah. Uh, Ron, please go ahead. Hi, Ron. I'm trying to figure out what the what the ultimate goal of this draft is. Are you building a network architecture for network operators and cloud providers uh, to implement, or are you suggesting the development of some new routing mechanism? Then, if the former, um, is is this the right forum in the routing area working group? Um, uh, yes, if the former, is this the right uh, uh, venue? Or maybe is it something that should be in the ops area? Okay, so Ron, as you can see, this is the architecture uh, draft of CON. Right now, we were trying to find a gap of the uh, CON and existing networks, and we have at least some existing uh, results right here, right? And we need more input to find where is the difference between the CON and existing network. And maybe we can find more like 
gap right there and we get more uh, new mechanism to address this kind of uh, issues and we will need more uh, mechanisms. Well, then the question Hello? goes to the chairs and the ADs is, isn't that like an ops area thing? I cannot answer your question right now because I don't have the answer correct uh, over so right here. here. So maybe we can yeah. Yeah, discuss of like. I mean, so in gen in general, you know, we we use the routing area working group as a sort of uh, open discussion platform. So you know, it has a, a pretty low threshold for presenting material, but a, a, a significantly higher threshold for uh, adopting particular drafts. So okay, fair, um, fair enough. We're not really talking about it. You know, I don't I don't think you know we're really in the context of adopting it yet. So. So Oliver could Thank address you, the CD from uh, my perspective, same comment as the previous presentation. Please try to narrow down your problem statement because as of today, it's just trying to boil the ocean. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. And now we've got- so Thank you, uh, guys. Shusang. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Yep, I'll switch over, switch the presentations over. Thank you. Give me a moment. Okay, it should be ready. Okay, that's cool. Uh, this is the last presentation and I won't make it too tough. Uh, this is Xue Song from Huawei and I will introduce our work about SRV6 middle point protection. Uh, I noticed Ron is raising his hand. Do you have any question for this presentation? I wrote it down from last time. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the outline of this presentation. Uh, the motivations and goals will be introduced. Uh, and because this uh, document has already been presented in ITF for maybe this is the third time, so the mechanisms and the security considerations has already been discussed before. I will go through briefly this time. Uh, and I will give some response to the questions we have already received in the working group. Next slide, please. Uh, so why we need SRV6 midpoint protection? Uh, in a SRV6 network, when an endpoint indicated in the SRV6 policies failed, are the existing FR mechanisms, for example, uh, TLFA, also defined in RTGWG, uh, can't protect the failed node because the current IPv6 destination address is pointing to the failed node. Uh, SRV6 end-to-end -end protection with BFD could work in this scenario, but uh, local mechanisms, which is faster and easier to deploy is also requested. Uh, there is another document in IETF that has already defined the endpoint protection mechanisms used in SRMPS network. And this document introduces an endpoint protection mechanism with uh, that could be used in an SRV6 network. Uh, we call this mechan mechanisms uh, SRV6 proxy forwarding. Uh, which means when an endpoint of SRV6 policy fails, uh, SRV6 uh, proxy forwarding node, uh, or we can call it repair node, could replace the failed node to perform SRV6 end function. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what is the mechanisms in detail? Um, 
when we we define this in two cases, when the repair node is adjacent to the failed endpoint, the repair node excludes the behavior defined in the pseudoware showed in the picture here. Uh, if the active segment is not the last segment in SRH, uh, first decrease the segments left by one, update uh, IPv6 destination with the next segment, or some segment after the active segment in the segment list, uh, and FIB lookup on the updated destination address and forward packet according to the matched entry. Uh, you can notice that this is almost the same as the end function defined in RFC 8986. Uh, if the active segment is the last segment in SRH, there is no next segment in the list, so just forward packet according to the backup Next, uh, next hop. Uh, when the repair node is remote, uh, sorry, not yet. There's another scenario when the repair node is remote to the failed endpoint. Uh, this case will happen when IGP convergence has already hap uh, uh, happened, and the repair node excludes the the similar behavior uh, as as the just introduced above. So next page, please. Okay, thanks. I apologize for the previous one. Uh, I got tricked by next hop. So. Ah, it's okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, in this document, uh, we introduced section five and section six, of which uh, section five is about uh, determining whether the endpoint could be bypassed or not. The section six is uh, security considerations. Both sections could be used for uh, security guarantee. Uh, in section six, the document uh, requests the required node and the failed node must belong to the same trusted domain, uh, which making the SRH could be changed safely by the re repair node. Uh, in section five, the document requests to ensure the security related segments can't be bypassed by the proxy for wording, uh, even when the corresponding node or link is failed. So, uh, but uh, the, the mechanisms request by uh, this scenario is defined in another document and the, the draft ID is listed here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here, uh, we list the questions that have been received since last ITF. All these questions have already been answered in the mailing list before. Um, just to discuss these questions in the working group again, we think this is necessary and meaningful. The first question is how to di uh, differentiate whether uh, the failed node is, uh, the, the fail failure is note down or link down. Uh, generally, link failure and node failure are both treated as node failure in this document, just as our FIR mechanisms. Uh, the second question is about uh, what function of the failed node could be excluded in the uh, repair node. Uh, because the proxy behavior is for past repair, which only guarantees the reachability. Uh, so other functions can't be replaced or proxied, only the end function is excluded. Uh, the third question is, uh, could TE pass be changed when doing protection? Actually, this is a very general uh, question. We believe the middlepoint protection is a, a temporary status. So it's uh, just for a temporary reachability repair when failure happens uh, in the TE pass. Uh, if SLA of the TE pass is supposed to be guaranteed during the process, end-to-end -end protection could be considered. So it's another story maybe after the, uh, the local repair happens. Uh, next slide. Uh, we believe this uh, document is uh, stable and the mechanisms are clear. All the questions have been discussed uh, in the working group. Maybe there are further uh, considerations afterwards. Uh, but in the existing uh, stage, we think the document is ready for working group adoption uh, and also welcome uh, comments and questions. Thank you.
Bruno, please go ahead. Uh, Bruno is speaking as a uh, spring co-chair. So the, the, the scope on the goal uh, is uh, very spring specific because it, uh, it exists only because you have a, a list of segments. Mm -hmm. um, then the, the mechanism is, uh, is, is a bit heavy on SRV6 uh, SRH uh, handling. Mm -hmm. And uh, third point, we have uh, in spring, we have a, doc a working group document with uh, the sc same scope for uh, SRM PLS. Yes. Um, so all in all, I think it would be uh, better to discuss it in the spring working group. Uh, yes, this have is you, a very you, good question. Uh -huh, have you sure, discussed it on the, on the spring mailing list or I haven't seen any, any email in the list? Uh, actually, um, this is a topic we have discussed before with other authors. We are a little confused now about where to discuss this document. Actually, because this document has been discussed in RTG, WG several times. So in this stage, maybe we prefer to put it here. Although we, we also believe spring is another good home for this document, but um, we are also willing to uh, to present the mechanisms to spring if necessary. But uh, considering, for example, TILFA is also defined in RTGWG, and this document is uh, informational. It's just about the uh, the the forwarding behavior, uh, considering the local repair. So. Uh, also, we, we, we would like to hear the, the chair's advice. Uh, Bruno, your advice is really uh, helpful and uh, maybe some discussions about the, the document's home is uh, deserves more discussion. So, yeah, I mean, if uh, I may interrupt here, I believe we had intentions to meet and discuss. There are about six or seven different drafts on midpoint endpoint protection that are being discussed between Spring and uh, RTGWG. Uh, Bruno, should we take an action point to actually meet between this ATF and next ATF and discuss all those drafts? Sure, sure. We can, uh, yeah, sure. Mm. Okay, so Shusan, let's uh, postpone your question till after we have discussed and possibly we could agree on home for most protection drafts and that would be a guideline for further development. Uh, okay, sure. So I, I would say up until this point, your your work has not been in vain. You know, it's it's mostly the same people attending this meeting as attending spring <laughs> as well. And so any discussion <laughs> that you've had, it's not like you'll have to like start over. You know, it it's already been a you know useful work, right? But if if um, I mean, it's a positive thing to have the spring working group chair say that. He, you know, he thinks it should be over in spring because at least that means he thinks it's important work. So, it's a. Um, okay, I wouldn't be you. discouraged by this development. Thank you. Okay. Really happy to know okay. that. Maybe you have okay. more helpful discussions in beer, uh, in in spring also. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. As Chris said, the looking at people overlap is probably 70-80%, so anything said here <laughs> is useful for Spring. Sure, sure. Uh, do we have any other questions, comments, wishes? Okay, I think we can close this. ATF, and we hope to see you all virtually in San Francisco in four months from now. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.